As Lisa was just recounting, I met Aaron at the Supreme Court in October of 2002, and we had gone to hear the oral argument in Eldred versus Ashcroft. Most of us non-lawyers had to spend the night sleeping in the street in line in front of the court in order to get a ticket. The line for the oral argument starts the night before. But even though Aaron was a teenager, he was Larry Lessig's personal guest at the argument. So since he had a ticket, he had the luxury of spending the night in a hotel, which his parents apparently really appreciated. But Aaron decided to spend most of the night and most of the morning before the argument hanging out with us at the encampment in front of the court, in part to show solidarity with the people who hadn't received a ticket, and in part for the thrill of meeting actual grown-up copyright activists. <laughs> Aaron was truly starstruck to meet people he thought of as legendary copyright reform activists. But within a decade, Aaron himself would be among the most effective grassroots copyright activists in the whole world. At that moment, he was the little kid markup and metadata expert that Larry Lessig admired enough to give him a front row Supreme Court seat. And Aaron spent the evening with us as we ordered pizza, which he could actually eat, for delivery to the sidewalk outside the Supreme Court, which was apparently not a very unusual request for pizzerias in DC. <laughs> and all of us gossiped about copyright law for a couple of hours. Um, I saw Aaron again in December. Uh, my friends Leonard and Sumana found a picture. He's visiting my house. And I come, uh, like some people here, from a book family, and I have a lot of books. And we spent about three hours with Leonard and Sumana and Aaron and I, just sitting on my bed, sort of manually following hyperlinks between books. <laughs> oh, that book. Oh, well, that's a reference to that book. Um, Aaron was there because Larry Lessig was unveiling his Creative Commons project in San Francisco. And Lessig had invited Aaron, clad in a t-shirt, probably the youngest person in the entire hall, up on stage to talk about metadata. It was very awkward. Aaron was trying to describe why it was useful to be able to represent bibliographic information in a machine-readable format. And in fact, Aaron was always trying to describe why it was useful to be able to represent bibliographic information in a machine-readable <laughs> format. The audience had had a few drinks, I think, and wasn't as focused as it might have been, and didn't really care to envision this beautiful future in which search engines would make it easy for everyone to find works they could legally reuse and build upon, which they now can, thanks to Aaron's work. But the audience didn't seem to get it. Lessig was very gracious, and he basically said to the crowd, see, our project is going to succeed, and it's going to succeed because we have this genius creating our infrastructure. Aaron reminded me how frustrating it is to be curious about things that other people don't understand or that other people regard as trivial or bizarre. He wrote a blog post about a theory that one's degree of nearsightedness is affected by blood oxygen levels and that it might be possible to use eye exercises to systematically reduce nearsightedness. Aaron, he wrote, was already experimenting on himself to see if it would work and he said he wished he could meet a girl who wouldn't laugh at this project. Later, Aaron met Seth Roberts, a researcher who advocates self-experimentation as a way of generating potentially useful wild ideas about health. Roberts and Aaron got along extremely well. I think that Roberts, like many other people, felt that Aaron naturally generated potentially useful wild ideas about absolutely everything. I visited Aaron in his dorm at Stanford a few years later. I was thrilled that he had the opportunity to study at such a great university. But Aaron was alienated from Stanford. He had few friends, and the students around him weren't curious about the things he was curious about. This wasn't the way his Stanford adventure was supposed to pan out. I helped him pack for his flight to Boston for his interview with Paul Graham, who was starting a fund to invest in young people just like Aaron. It went well. Aaron dropped out of Stanford, moved to Boston. In 2006, just after Condé Nast acquired Reddit, just before they fired Aaron, Aaron and I were at a hacker conference together in Berlin. To Larry Lessig's chagrin, Aaron and Lessig had, at that time, fallen out of touch. Perhaps neither of them were deeply involved in the day-to-day -day work of Creative Commons, which had brought them together. 
Aaron had gone off to work in the startup world while simultaneously deepening his study of left-wing politics, macroeconomics, and sociology. Lessig and Aaron were both planning to tell America, as a matter of some urgency, what had gone wrong with the American project, but they had slightly different diagnoses. A friend and I took Aaron out to Wannsee, where Lessig was spending a year at the American Academy in Berlin. Lessig looked extraordinarily proud to see Aaron. Their meeting had, for me, the sense of an extraordinarily poignant reunion, as if they hadn't seen each other in 20 years. Of course, they had actually seen each other a few months before. But my friend and I left the two of them alone for an hour or so, and I remember as we walked away, seeing Lessig and Aaron leaning against a wall at the Vansay train station, talking animatedly to each other. It reminded me of the scene at the climax of the German film Goodbye Lenin, where we can see but not hear the actors talking about incredibly urgent matters, and we have to imagine for ourselves what they must be saying to each other. And I thought, Lessig is so proud, his protege is all grown up, and he's come back to show his respect for his teacher. Aaron was a free speech absolutist, free speech absolutist, an idealist idealist, an activist activist, and I must say, a libertarian socialist libertarian socialist. <laughs> his credo was that bits are not a bug, that come hell or high water we should celebrate and not fear people's ability to communicate to each other whatever they might choose to communicate and the infrastructure that supports that ability. Aaron came of age a long time after the end of the cypherpunk movement, but he always seemed like a cypherpunk and lived up to the notion that cypherpunks write code. He channeled all sorts of different idealisms of supposedly bygone eras. You would have thought he was too young to know about those idealisms. And he did it in a way that mixed intelligence, creativity, and humor. In the long run, Aaron felt that he was going to fix the world mainly by clearly explaining it to people. <laughs> I believe Aaron grew up to be exactly the person that he would have been most astonished and excited to meet in the line in front of the Supreme Court. I've never known anyone else like him. <laughs>